Welcome to Kane Hall, and welcome today to the third and final presentation in the 2014 Engineering Lecture Series, Engineering the Heart from Cell Therapy to Computer Technology. In this final lecture of the series, we are shifting our focus to computer and electrical devices and their potential to improve health inside our bodies. In particular, the field of wireless power is rapidly advancing and has the potential to change the way we interact with almost everything around us. Many promising applications exist in the field of healthcare with potential to make it easier and safer to power machines and devices that, for example, keep hearts beating. Tonight, you're going to hear about emerging technologies in wireless power that will improve our quality of life in healthcare and beyond. Today's speaker is Josh Smith, who is an associate professor of computer science and engineering and electrical engineering. He leads the Sensor Systems Research Group. He also leads the Communication and Interface Thrust at the Center for Sensorimotor Neural Engineering. He also leads Low Power Sensing and Communications at the Intel Science and Technology Center for Pervasive Computing. And his research focuses on wirelessly powering sensor systems for biomedical electronics, ubiquitous computing, and robotics. I've also had the personal uh, privilege and pleasure of working closely with Josh, first as a researcher, then as his department chair, and now uh, as uh, the uh, executive director for the Center for Commercialization, where I work with Josh and his colleagues to uh, commercialize some of his technologies. So it's my privilege today to introduce you to Josh Smith. Thank you very much, Vikram, for that kind introduction, and thanks for the invitation to speak in the College of Engineering Lecture Series. It's a real pleasure and honor. So the title of my talk is Cutting the Cord, Wireless Power for Implantable Devices. And uh, <clears throat> before I get started, a couple of quick disclaimers. I'll be talking about investigational devices that are not approved for use. So in other words, don't try this at home. Um, <clears throat> And uh, we have UW and, in some cases, Yale University have patents on some of the technologies we'll be talking about. Now, before I get into talking about medical devices, I'll give you a little bit of context for the way our research group thinks about this. We tend to think about things in terms of the Internet of Things, which you can think of as, as basically smart, connected devices, uh, kind of everywhere. You know, how do we connect all kinds of things up to the Internet? And what it has to do with implanted devices is even devices inside the body. You can imagine being connected uh, electronically and informationally uh, to uh, other, other things, other, other networks. Now, the problem that we're going to be talking about tonight is if we're going to put electronic devices everywhere, you know, even inside the body, there's a, there's a serious problem, which is how are we supposed to power those devices? Um, and that problem also extends to the Internet of Things in general. It's not just implanted in the body. So most of my talk is going to be about implanted medical devices, but we'll also talk about some of the other uh, things we're doing where some of these same or related problems come up. So before we start to answer this question of how are we going to power these devices, I'll tell you how we're not going to power them. Uh, <laughs> you know, we don't want this. We don't all, all these wires and cords. Uh, batteries are also a problem. Um, you know, so batteries are heavy, they're large, and those, those constraints come up in some of the applications that, that we're looking at. And of course, batteries also run out. Um, in the case of things like pacemakers, it requires surgery. In some of the other applications we'll be talking about, it's just not feasible to use batteries because they're not, they just don't store enough energy for some of these applications. So <clears throat> before we start talking about powering implanted medical devices, just do a little review or survey of what are the implanted medical devices uh, that are being used today. Uh, and it's, it's kind of amazing. If you're not completely uh, focused on this question, it's amazing how much implanted electronics is already uh, in, you know, in our bodies clinically. Um, and, and also, of course, in research, there's uh, uh, even more going on. So uh, there are cochlear implants, which are used to help uh, restore hearing, uh, retinal implants. Uh, uh, it's kind of amazing. These are installed inside people's eyes uh, and, and used to help restore vision. Uh, deep brain stimulators uh, is another technology that is uh, 
uh, being used quite widely. So in the lower right uh, image, you see an x-ray of a skull, and you can see some kind of fine, uh, that look like wires that are going down deep into the brain stem. And these are being used uh, to treat uh, seizures and uh, uh, even starting to be used by psychiatrists to uh, help uh, control depression and, and things like that. Um, so there are things being installed electronically uh, in people's brains uh, already. Um, the pacemaker, of course, is something that is very well known. This is a device that is implanted uh, in the body and just generates control signals for the heart. So it just helps the heart beat at the right time. There's also the, the defibrillator, or the, often they combine the pacemaker and the defibrillator. So if the heart starts beating incorrectly, the defibrillator provides kind of a large jolt to get it uh, beating uh, properly again. In fact, I'm sure there, there are probably some people in this room who have uh, some of these devices. Um, now, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is uh, the left ventricular assist device, which may be less familiar probably than, than pacemakers. But what this is is a uh, pump that is put in parallel with the heart. Um, and you can actually see an image of one right, right here, kind of schematic. Um, so it uh, connects from, from the bottom uh, up here to the top. And uh, it's basically a pump that is helping the heart by, uh, you know, a diseased heart by providing extra blood flow. And over here in the top right was the pacemaker that we were talking about before. So the power consumption requirements of these two devices, you know, are very different. Because the pacemaker is just providing some small electrical control signals once in a while. In fact, if everything's going fine, the pacemaker may just be sitting there not doing much. The left ventricular assist device is a pump that's on all the time, so that consumes vastly more power. So it's much more challenging. That's why pacemakers are powered by batteries and, and left ventricular devices uh, cannot be powered this way. So I'll give you a little preview of the solution right here. Here's my first PhD student, a Lanson sample. And this video is the first time he got this working, which I always find is kind of interesting to see the first time that it, that it worked. Um, so, whoops, let me try that again. Okay, so this is a 60-watt you know, light bulb that uh, he's powering wirelessly over a distance of a couple of feet. Um, so clearly, we're in, we're in the ballpark of what we need to be able to do uh, to power implanted heart pumps. And I'm gonna be telling you a lot more about this and other problems. So when I think about wireless power, I like to kind of divide up the different possibilities uh, using these, these two axes. So um, <clears throat> for most of these implanted devices, we're talking about what I would call planted power, where we're gonna deliberately transmit a signal with the purpose of collecting it later. So we're purposely sending power from one place to another. There's also wild power, which is where you know, there are signals in the air that were put there for some other reason, like TV signals or radio signals. They're not intended to be a power source, but it turns out, as we'll see later on, you can actually use them as a power source. So that's planted versus wild. And then the other important distinction is near field versus far field. So near field basically means that we're sending power short distances, but we can send a lot of power. And far field uh, tends to be small amounts of power, but we can uh, send it much further. So I'm gonna start by talking about uh, this quarter of the, of the space, so near field and planted. And the little video that I showed you just now is an example of this. So uh, the acronym I have there is Wireless Resonant Energy Link, or WIRL. And uh, so what I just showed you in the video was a system like this. So we have on the transmit side a coil, which is uh, highly tuned to a specific frequency. It's a resonator. Uh, high quality factor resonator, which means it really likes to ring at one particular frequency, and it rings really well at that frequency. And then on the receive side, you have kind of the same thing, another highly tuned resonator. And then we can couple signals into the transmit side. Uh, the power propagates you know, through the air, separating these things, and then gets picked up over on the receive side. Now, I'm gonna explain a little bit about how this works with a mechanical analogy. So the um, pendulums that you see here, uh, uh, the left pair of pendulums is, is analogous to, the, to this wireless power system in one of its operating modes. And the right pair of pendulums is the same wireless power system operating in a different way. 
and this will all become clear soon. So <clears throat> each pendulum is like one of the coils. Now, if you think about a pendulum, it has a natural frequency that it likes to, to go at, um, which is based on the, the mass and, and so forth. So the transmit coil is like one of those pendulums. The receive coil is like another pendulum. And that spring that you see connecting them together is like the magnetic field that is, that is linking them. And so the key thing to notice is that this system of two pendulums, the transmit side, the receive side, has two ways that it can oscillate. So one, you can see the, the pendulums are going in the same direction, and in the other, they're going opposite directions. And so these are called two normal modes. And the key thing to observe, which may be a little hard to tell from this picture, is that the frequency uh, is different. So the one where they're going back and forth together, it's slower in frequency. And the one where they're going opposite each other, it's faster in frequency. Um, and so a system like this where you have two coupled uh, resonators, like the transmit coil and the receive coil, actually has two natural frequencies, two good frequencies. So you'll see in a second what this all is about and why I'm telling you this. Um, the plot that I'm showing you here is related to the wireless power system. Um, or analogously, those pendulums. So the vertical axis is efficiency, so how well can we transfer power? The horizontal axis here, this front one, is distance. And this axis over here is frequency. Now what's going on here is when the transmit coil and the receive coil are very close, that's kind of like having the two pendulums with a very tight spring in between them. And it turns out that the difference in frequency between that in-phase mode where the pendulums are going together and the anti-phase mode is larger the more tightly those, that spring is wound. So the, when the transmit coil and the receive coil get very close, we have two very different frequencies at which the system will work well. As you move further away, those frequencies get closer. But so the key of all of this, the point of all of this, is that if my transmit coil and receive coil are moving back and forth, they're changing position, they're changing distance and orientation, what this picture shows you is that if I could pick the right frequency, which is this dimension here, then I could stay on top of this V-shaped plateau. And so that's kind of the, uh, uh, the thing that we discovered how to do and, and discovered that you could do, which is basically build a wireless power system that has almost constant efficiency. So as I move the transmit receive uh, coils from one another, you, know, you might expect that the further the receiver is from the transmitter, the less power you get. But what this picture shows you, if you imagine looking at this surface from the side, is that as the receiver moves further away, we're going to actually get the same amount of power. We're not going to get less power um, if we adjust things properly. And so that's kind of the big insight here, is that this is a way to build a wireless power system where even as we move the transmitter and receiver around, we're going to be able to deliver basically the same amount of power. Now, of course, nothing that sounds too good to be true. And if you go too far away, you can see the best possible efficiency sort of drops off. So hopefully this will become even clearer right now. I'm going to show you a video. So in the first section of the video, we're moving the transmit and receive coil closer and further. And you're going to see that the light bulb is on sometimes and it's off other times. When it's too far away, it's off, of course. When it's too close, it's also off. In the next section of the video, we're going to turn on the auto tuning, which is going to control the system so that we stay on top of that plateau and you're going to see that the light bulb stays on the whole time. So you can see it's on in that kind of hot, sweet spot in the middle. Now it's off when it's too close. And again, when it's too far away, it's off. So this is what happens if we don't do adaptation. So in terms of that picture, we're just moving in a straight line over the hump in the middle of that V-shaped surface. Now you can see we've turned on the auto-tuning, and you can see the light bulb basically stays on pretty much all the time. Even as we get too close, or if we turn the coil in different orientations, the light bulb basically stays on. Um, now here's another really neat trick you can do with this. You can see now the transmit and receive coil are too far away from one another. We can put another coil in the middle, and the power is actually multi-hopping. It's going from the tr transmit side to the one in the middle. There's no battery or power source in the middle. It just hops across. And you can also use that to make the power turn a corner, which is kind of neat. So. Um, Hopefully, uh, that uh, gave you a sense of how this particular um, near-field wireless power transfer system works. Now I'm going to be telling you about what we call free, uh, free-range resonant electrical energy delivery. And this is a, uh, uh, 
application of what I just showed you to powering implanted heart pumps. So <clears throat> the problem that we're uh, thinking about ultimately, backing up to the medical context, is um, end-stage heart failure. So uh, the picture that you see here shows a heart and one uh, example of a left ventricular assist device connected to the heart. So this is a pump that's in parallel with the heart. And then you see it's got a cord, the drive line, which brings the power into that pump. And then here's the key problem. You see that cord coming out of the patient's abdomen here. And then it goes to this kind of large controller device. Um, and then there are a couple of batteries worn on the side. Um, so there are you know, a large number of transplant candidates uh, in the US and worldwide, uh, more being added all the time. But there's a very limited number of transplants actually available. So potentially, you could imagine using left ventricular assist devices to help. Rather than doing transplants, uh, maybe you could uh, use these pumps. Um, <clears throat> and they have been used. Originally, they were used for bridge to transplant. So they were used as a temporary measure until the transplant became available. Uh, now it's becoming uh, more common to, to try to use it as a destination therapy, as, as a longer term solution. Um, so here is a picture again of a, of a left ventricular assist device. You can see that uh, you know, the idea is that it pumps, pumps blood from the left ventricular to the aorta. Uh, it's off, usually put on, on the left side, which is why they're left ventricular assist devices. But there are also right and bidirectional. And then there was an important study in 2001 called the REMATCH trial, which showed that BADs are, are efficacious, to, to, to put it very uh, uh, simply. Um, <clears throat> the history of these devices is, is interesting. Uh, they've you know, evolved from larger, cruder devices uh, on the right, some of which actually used air uh, pumps uh, to make them work. Um, the more recent ones are magnetically levitated motors. They've been getting smaller. Um, here are, <clears throat> I think these are all the uh, uh, pumps that are uh, on the market or, or soon to be on the market uh, today. Um, so there's the Thoratec HeartMate 2 and 3, and then kind of a new, relative newcomer, Heartware HVAD, and then the, the MVAD I think is not, not yet uh, in use uh, clinically, I believe, although I know there are other people here who know more about the space. Um, <clears throat> so the project that I'm telling you about where we're going to wirelessly power this implanted heart pump is a collaboration with uh, Dr. Pramod Bondi, who is a heart surgeon at Yale School of Medicine. Um, and he specializes in uh, mechanical circulatory support, so, so left ventricular assist devices. So, you know, the essential problem is, is there just are not enough donor hearts available. Um, the, these pumps, left ventricular assist devices, could potentially solve the problem, but you have this exit site uh, where the cord comes out. That can become infected. It affects quality of life because people can't shower. They have to take a sponge bath instead. Uh, that cord can be yanked. There's all kinds of reasons why you would like to get rid of that cord. Um, and so we've been working on uh, trying to do that. Now, people have previously tried to fully wirelessly power uh, LVADs, and that was with an earlier generation of wireless power technology that uh, basically didn't have the kind of adaptation capabilities that I demonstrated to you earlier. And so the problem is that you know, as the transmit coil or receive coil shifted, um, they would have to crank up the transmit power, um, which would lead to heating, and uh, ultimately that's why uh, th those, those haven't worked out. Um, so here I'll show you uh, the system uh, uh, that we've been developing. Um, <clears throat> what you see, uh, actually our system has evolved, so this is actually even a, an older system, but we have um, you know, a power amplifier that generates uh, uh, signals. Um, Again, this, this, is, this is shrunk down uh, from this picture. Um, so the patient would wear this along with a battery. Then they would have a, a coil, transmit coil, in the vest that they're wearing. And then implanted receive coil like this. And over here, you can see the entire implanted side. So here's the heart pump. Here's the uh, receive coil. So this receives the power. This converts those uh, oscillating uh, AC signals picked up from the receive coil uh, into usable DC. Um, and this can directly power the pump, and it can also recharge this battery. So you want to have a 
<clears throat> even though we can't power the pump for a long period of time with uh, a battery, we can potentially pump power it for half an hour or something like that. So if the person wants to take a shower or you know, change their clothes, et cetera, they, they can do that. So in this video, my student Ben Waters is going to be demonstrating the entire system. Um, so he, here's his battery, and you can see he's got a smaller transmitter now. It's, it's bits in that little fanny pack that he's got. There's the transmitter and the transmit coil. So that would be in his, uh, in his vest. And then everything you see on the left, the pump and so forth, would be uh, implanted. He's a very dedicated student. I don't know why he didn't want to get this implanted. Um, OK, so now you can see that if you look at the water, that the pump is actually on. And you'll notice that he's moving the receive coil around quite a bit. So the early generation, when they tried this previously, you had to really put the transmitter receive coils in contact, and they had to be perfectly aligned. But you can see here, he's able to move it. You know, He's got quite a bit of range, and he can move it in various orientations, and it continues to work. You can even put them side by side. It works in that geometry. Uh, so there's a lot of neat stuff that can be done with this. Now, here I'll show you a bit more about the, the tracking. Uh, this is actually a robot that was built by a, a heart pump company to help test uh, the system. Um, so we're moving, you know, this robot is moving the transmit coil relative to the receive coil. And um, we're adjusting frequency so that we keep constant efficiency. Uh, but we're also adjusting power level so that if it does move further away, uh, the transmitter will put out some extra power in order to uh, keep the pump running where it should be. And you can see there are various numbers over here on the right side reading out the efficiency um, and so forth. And here in this case, you can see we're moving it in more complicated ways. Instead of just moving in horizontal plane, we're also moving it vertically. So testing all this stuff out. So there's actually a lot of software in the system too. It's not just the hardware. There's firmware that's generating the signals and, uh, on both sides, and, uh, and then a lot of uh, software to control the whole system, some of which you can see on the screen there. So <clears throat> I mentioned our, our collaborator, Dr. Pramod Bondi, and uh, uh, also working with him is, is James Bomeister. So we've actually been implanting this in uh, pigs to test it out. Uh, so we've, we've tried it uh, five times, although even today there was another trial uh, or two at Yale, so maybe we're up to six. Um, and <clears throat> one of the key questions we're trying to ask is, you know, is it, is it heating up too much? Because that's one of the key problems. One of the things that went wrong when this was tried previously was too much heat was generated. Um, so that's one of the key questions. And that's something that you really have to do in an animal experiment because the animal's body carries away a lot of heat. And it's really, you know, difficult to model that um, currently. So hopefully you're not squeamish. Uh, what you see here is a, uh, there's an LVAD that is uh, keeping, this, keeping this pig alive. Um, I'll just click to the next picture so we can see a little bit better. So this is the transmit coil. The receive coil is under the pig's skin over here. This is our electronic device. It's not actually inserted into the body just because for this test we don't need to do that. Um, the LVAD itself is just out of the frame here. Um, and then here are the, the cannulas that carry the blood to and from the heart. And then all these blue wires that you see are, are temperature probes. So you know, we need to measure the temperature uh, all, all around the, the animal to, to, to ensure that we're not generating too much, um, too much heat. Now, one other interesting experiment that we're getting into in collaboration with, uh, with Dr. Bondi is um, <coughs> that today, most left ventricular assist devices are continuous flow. So they're just on all the time. Obviously, our hearts are beating. Uh, so you know, if you have a continuous flow VAD, you don't necessarily have much of a pulse. It's just kind of on continuously. Um, and now there's experimentation in actually driving uh, the, the LVADs with a, with a pulse, so artificially changing the speed to generate a pulse. It seems physiologically uh, more similar to what is going on now. So what we're trying to do is measure the heart's uh, you know, naturally occurring electrical signal and sync our pump to that so that we pulse along with the heart. And this is very, very early stage, but uh, uh, something exciting that's going on right now. 
Now, of course, one of the key questions with all of this work is, uh, is it safe? So <clears throat> the things you have to think about are, you know, what, is the, what are the field strengths that we're subjecting the, the, the body to? Um, and there's a quantity that uh, is the, the key quantity called the specific absorption rate, or SAR, and that has to do with how much is the tissue, tissue being heated up by these electromagnetic uh, signals, and we'll talk more about that in a second. There's also sort of more indirect heating. So if the coil gets hot just because there's a little bit of inefficiency, that can be a problem too. The electronics themselves can heat up and, and be too hot uh, for the body. And of course, you have to think about uh, all, the, all the various regulations. Um, so there are regulations about what frequency you can emit signals, what sort of bandwidth you can use, uh, the field strength of those emissions. So these things are all uh, key. And um, efficiency is also important because of course, we want to minimize transmitted power so we can keep the battery life of the transmit side as high as possible. And also, we don't want to generate heating. By definition, if we're losing energy, that's probably being turned into heat somewhere. So we want to minimize that. But um, what I'll tell you about now is, you know, what is the mechanism that causes RF heating? Because that's actually what limits uh, our ability to do this. This is what limits how much power we can send. So what you see here, uh, the little Mickey Mouse is, of course, a water molecule. So you've got the large negatively charged oxygen and then the two hydrogen uh, atoms, which are essentially positively charged in this configuration. So this is an electrically polar molecule. And if we apply an electric field, it, the, the water molecule is going to try to align with, with that electric field. And of course, that's how a microwave oven actually heats up your food. The water in the food is, is being aligned uh, with the field you know, a couple of billion times a second, and that motion turns into heat. Um, but so that's what we don't want to do. Uh, <clears throat> so it turns out that, of course, electric fields make the water molecules orient because water is electrically polar, but magnetic fields don't really affect the water. So to the extent we can generate a magnetic field and minimize the electric field that we generate, we're going to be able to transfer power without heating up the body. So that's, that's our goal. Now, of course, if you're generating an oscillating magnetic field, you're always generating some electric field. But so the art here is to try to minimize that electric field. And so we work with uh, the ITIS Foundation and Professor Niels Kuster uh, in ETH Zurich, who's one of the experts on bioelectromagnetics. Uh, and so they have annotated models of the human body, uh, you know, child, adult male, all different body sizes. Uh, adult female, and uh, they've annotated all the organs with their electrical properties. So what's the dielectric constant of the pancreas and uh, so forth. And given that, they can take those <clears throat> that geometry, put it in a simulator along with our coils, and calculate how much heating uh, is going to be, uh, is going to occur given different configurations and different power levels. And so what that work has showed us, um, it's relatively uh, preliminary work, but this, the power levels that are, that are safe uh, are somewhere in the range of you know, 45 watts to uh, a couple of hundred watts. So um, you know, there's a lot more uh, interesting work to be done here, but um, that is uh, one of the key questions that we're working on. Now, <clears throat> what I'm going to tell you about next is some other uh, systems. Rather than heart pumps, there are all kinds of other places in the body where implanted electronics can be useful. Um, in particular, the nervous system, there's the brain, the spine, and peripheral nerves, and all of these uh, have various treatments or various conditions that can potentially be treated with implanted electronics. So we mentioned, you know, deep brain stimulation. These are actually widely deployed already, um, treated, used to treat, you know, Parkinson's, essential tremor, chronic pain, all kinds of things. Um, the spinal cord, and I'll be talking about a project we have related to uh, the spine and paralysis. And then peripheral nerves uh, as well as a newer topic. Um, there are all kinds of organs that you can potentially treat by generating electrical signals in various parts of the body or in various nerves in the body. So I'll start by talking about the brain. So we have a center here called the, at UW and also with MIT and San Diego State University called the Center for Sensory Motor Neural Engineering. Um, the image you see in the center is, is taken by Jeff Ogeman, who's a neurosurgeon uh, here uh, in, 
at, at Children's. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so this, this technique is called ECOG, electrocorticography, and it's a technique for measuring electrical activity on the surface of the brain. And so neurosurgeons use this to find seizures and figure out what part of the, the brain is malfunctioning and then try to treat it. Now currently, this is just a very short-term process. So uh, someone will have one of these devices implanted for a week or maybe two weeks while they're in the hospital having the study done. But if we could solve the power problem and also some other important problems like electrodes that will stay in the brain without causing problems, um, then you could imagine putting this inside uh, someone's head who has epilepsy and, and putting it in there permanently. Then it could detect problems, communicate to the surgeon, or maybe even do some stimulation to stop a seizure once it started. So working with various colleagues in electrical engineering, um, working with Chris Rudell and um, Bisvesh Sate and Matt Reynolds, we're designing a single chip that will be small enough to implant uh, in the head and that will be able to sense electrical activity, um, do some computing, do communication. So a lot of times you want to get the, the signals out for research purposes and, and for uh, uh, diagnostic purposes. And then also it will be able to stimulate, so to be able to you know, sort of turn off these tremors. Um, with uh, Chet Moritz and Adrian Fairhall, who are both in physiology and biophysics, that's part of the uh, uh, med school, uh, <clears throat> we're working on uh, trying to do this or things like this uh, for the spine. So the idea here is for people who have a severed spinal cord and are, are paralyzed as a result, we're going to sense the intention to move in the brain and then stimulate in the spine. And that turns out <clears throat> to be uh, kind of easier than you might expect because it turns out the spine is not just a wire carrying signals from the brain to the rest of the body. It's actually really a computer that generates a lot of complicated signals. So what that means is you can inject a fairly simple signal into the spine, and then it will in turn translate that into a lot of complicated motor commands to the muscles. Um, so some you know, various people around the world have demonstrated they can do things like get cats to walk again, cats who've been temporarily paralyzed by generating fairly simple signals into the spine. So uh, that's what we're aiming to do uh, with uh, a, a grant from the, the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation. We have a new project with uh, uh, Bing Brunton, who's a new professor of uh, biology, uh, trying to <coughs> do something similar for, um, for peripheral nerves. So there's a whole variety of organs that potentially uh, could, be, could be treated, you know, rather than giving someone pharmaceuticals, you can imagine what you might call neuroceuticals, where you stimulate certain nerves to achieve therapeutic ends. So this is another exciting area that we're working on. So that basically is the end of the implanted, you know, in-body electronics that I wanted to tell you about. <clears throat> and now we're going to look at various other uh, applications uh, of wireless power. So. Um, I'll tell you about some robotics work we've been doing. This is with uh, Professor Rob Wood at Harvard. So he has a project called RoboBees, where he's trying to build robotic bees. Uh, <coughs> and uh, it's really impressive, amazing. They've actually got these things to fly. But if you look in all the movies, what you'll see, if you look really carefully, is little fine wires coming out of the bee. So they have a power problem, uh, like everybody. Um, and so <clears throat> we can't yet wirelessly power uh, uh, these bees. They, they take a lot of power and they're small. But what we're doing um, to get started is powering these little sort of cockroaches that he also <laughs> makes. So uh, that robot has no battery. It's being powered by the uh, uh, magnetic fields being emitted from below. Uh, it's got a little receive coil. And, uh, but this is fabricated using his same techniques that he uses to build the bees. So it's easier, but it's a way to get uh, started. Um, now, when I showed this to one of my daughters, she said, Dad, that's the lamest thing in the world. Why would you want to wirelessly power a robot from one inch away? What's the point? <laughs> and I said, OK, well, hold on. Uh, maybe that robot is behind the wall, and we have a little transmit coil out here so we can go inspect what's going on inside the wall, find you know, there's a leak or there are wires that are not right or something. Or, or maybe that robot is inside the body and it's 
inspecting or doing surgery, and she said, stop, you're, you're freaking me out. I don't, don't want to hear it. <laughs> but, but seriously, I think actually a small surgical robot inside the body uh, you know, probably could, could, be, uh, uh, could be interesting, and you, you might want to wirelessly power it. Now, uh, on the topic of wirelessly powered robots, we've also had a lot of interest from various robotic companies recently uh, wanting to wirelessly recharge their robots. So this robot that you see here is from a Silicon Valley startup, and uh, it drove up to our transmitter there. There's its receive coil, and just for demonstration purposes, the light just comes on. So this is uh, my student, Ben Waters, has been doing this. Um, now, you might think, well, why didn't the robot just plug itself in? Sounds easy, but actually, it's really, really hard to do that. And I've done it in the past using a $400,000 robot. But if you want a consumer, you know, a couple hundred or a thousand dollar robot, getting that kind of precision and having it work reliably is really, really difficult. Um, we also did some experiments with the Roomba, which is a little consumer vacuum uh, cleaner. And it comes with something that it's supposed to be able to dock with. Um, but we had, you know, zero out of 50 successful trials with that the other day in the lab. Um, so it turns out to be a lot easier to make this work. And so Ben is starting a company called Wibotic that's going to be commercializing this, um, you know, starting with robots, of which we have a surprising number of companies uh, already interested. So that basically concludes the discussion of the far, uh, the near field uh, wireless power work. Um, now what I'm going to tell you about is some of the, the far field. And so this sort of space of applications is different. Most of this is not going to be, this is not going to be in the body. This is going to be, um, <coughs> you know, sensors that are far away. Um, so this is Internet of Things, but not necessarily uh, not medical. So this video is an early one. Now I was working the remote, which is why I'm making kind of a strange expression. The picture frame on the right is a transmitter, uh, transmitting radio waves. And the little stack of boards I'm holding is being powered by those radio waves. Um, and <clears throat> so there's no battery uh, in my hand there. Um, as I tilt the thing back and forth, uh, an accelerometer sensor is detecting gravity showing up on different uh, channels. So as the board tilts, gravity shows up on the, different, uh, the three different channels that this thing has. It's got a little computer, a little programmable computer, reads the sensor values, and then communicates that sensor data back to the reader using a technique called backscatter, which uh, is a very low power communication technique where Instead of having that little stack of boards emit its own radio signals, it just reflects the signals that the reader is providing. Um, now, systems like this, you know, power harvesting systems in general, all work in kind of a similar way. So this red trace that you see here is the voltage accumulated. So when you turn on the reader, let's say, or you bring the tag near the reader, it starts, the voltage starts charging up. And when it has enough accumulated, it gets above this upper threshold here, system wakes up, does its sensing, starts reflecting uh, uh, signals back to the reader that's doing its work, and that causes it to discharge a little bit, and then it goes to sleep again, um, charges up for a little while, does its work, charges up again. So all of these power harvesting systems have a similar character where they collect power for a while <clears throat> while they're asleep, they do their work, then they go back to sleep and collect uh, power again. And the more power there is, the more quickly they can wake up and do their work. So uh, I just show that because oftentimes people have a question, how does this work? Is it storing energy? And the answer is yes, it does store energy for a little while. And the more energy is available, the faster it, it can work. Now, one interesting question that I asked myself when we first got that working was, why were we able to do that now? And you know, why hadn't we been able to do things like that? Power little computers by radio signals you know, from 10, 10 feet away. Why couldn't we have done that 20, 30 years ago? And this, this plot gives you the answer. So the horizontal axis that you see is, is time, so going back to 1940. Um, and the vertical axis is the number of instructions we can execute per microjoule. So this is showing energy efficiency. So there are plots that look a lot like this you may have seen before that are from Moore's Law that are showing how many transistors you can fit on a square centimeter of silicon. And that's been going up like this too. This plot is showing that for the same amount of energy, we can do more and more computation. So this resource is improving exponentially. And in some ways, this trend is actually more general than Moore's Law, because if you look at the left side of this, we're going back to ENIAC. So we're looking at vacuum tubes, which weren't even, 
weren't even uh, you know, transistors. They weren't even silicon wafers. Um, so this trend, in some ways, has been going on for even longer than Moore's Law. But the exciting thing, too, is if you go in the other direction, got the brain out here. Um, now, this doesn't mean that we don't have brains until 2040. Um, <laughs> what it does mean is that we won't have computers that are as energy efficient as the brain until 2040. Um, but, but I think this is kind of encouraging because it shows that there's plenty of room for improvement still. There's about a factor of a million in energy efficiency that we can still get. <clears throat> so one question we've been asking recently is, well, okay, so we can do these little things like accelerometers. What else can we do? Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this one, but show this one. So just recently, my student, Saman Naderi Parisi, got a, uh, a battery-free wireless camera working. Um, so this is a device sort of similar to what I showed you in that first video, uh, but instead of doing this sort of simple sensing technique, it's actually taking a picture. Now to do this, it has to accumulate energy for quite a while. So rather than waiting you know, milliseconds and then taking its picture, going back to sleep, it has to accumulate power for, for much longer. So at a range of a meter, it takes about 20 seconds for it to accumulate enough energy to take a picture and then backscatter that picture. Um, at four meters, it can take a picture every three and a half minutes. Um, but there are lots of applications, we think, where that will be very useful. So there's all kinds of surveillance cameras and inspection cameras. You could build these uh, you know, into walls or put them uh, on the gutter on top of your house. You maybe only want to see what's in that gutter once a quarter or a couple times a year. Um, maybe never, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, the other kind of neat thing, so all these pictures in the bottom row were taken with this camera. Uh, but one neat thing is that the camera was in the other room. So we had the reader in one room pointed through the wall, the, the, tag, uh, the camera on the other side being powered and read uh, right through the wall. And that's kind of similar to what we're doing with implanted uh, electronics where you know, the boundary is, in this case, the wall instead of the, the skin. Um, OK, so now, now we'll quickly visit this last quadrant of the, of the space of wirelessly powered systems. So this is far field but wild. So we call this warp wireless ambient radio power. What we realized is that the amount of power we were seeing from an RFID reader was similar to the amount of radio power that you get from, say, a TV tower in downtown Seattle. So the picture that you see there is actually a uh, one megawatt TV tower in, in the center of Seattle. And um, <coughs> in our first experiment, we took a commercial um, TV antenna, hooked it up to our rectifier circuit, and uh, were able to power a uh, kitchen thermometer. And the plot that you see here is Seattle. Here's the TV tower in the middle. Uh, we'd expect to get 100 microwatts out here and maybe 25 microwatts further out. Um, so I'm going to skip a couple of things here in the interest of, of time. Um, another uh, recent result with my colleague, Sham Galakota, is we found that so we can build these two devices called ambient backscatter communication devices that are both powered by the TV signals. And then they can actually talk to each other by reflecting those radio signals uh, that are coming from the TV tower. So this is neat because you can imagine having devices that are doing sensing, or computing, whatever, that are uh, you know, powered externally. And you, know, you don't need to set up a reader or anything like that. So uh, let me show you this, this video. Um, Make sure the sound is off, actually, and I'll just narrate it. So these two devices are actually now being powered by a TV tower that's way in the background, you know, miles away. This reader is reading out the state. So you imagine these are cards with money stored in them. So the value at first is 110 units. So we were using that powered reader to just read the state. This card has some money in it. We're transferring the money from the bottom card to the top card. So the student, Vomsi, is pushing the button, which is causing the transfer. So now we're going to use this reader device again to read out the state. And now it reads 130. So we actually transferred data uh, from one of these wirelessly powered devices to another uh, just using the pre-existing radio signals. Now, what are the kinds of things you can do with that? Well, if we can put devices everywhere that's, that kind of know what's going on and don't need power, they don't need batteries or wires, you can imagine doing things like you know, having one on your keys and maybe another built into the sofa. Uh, then when you get up, you left your keys at the sofa. Uh, the sofa is now smart, so it can send you a little text that says, you know, you left your keys. Um, that's the sort of promise of, 
um, these Internet of Things uh, devices is that you can build devices anywhere and um, you know, have them uh, be powered uh, externally without a lot of infrastructure. So what we're asking ourselves is, you know, what's next? Uh, and one of the things we're looking at doing is, uh, is commercializing this. So we have a company, uh, spelling or the name might change a little bit, but Jiva Wireless, and the idea is to create power and internet connectivity for the next billion devices using these sorts of ideas. So we've already seen, you know, batteries are a problem. Uh, the Internet of Things could potentially give us all this big physical data, but if we have to put batteries everywhere, it's not going to work. So what we're looking at doing is using Wi-Fi, which is kind of everywhere, uh, to power and connect all kinds of devices. So you can imagine having a router device that does all the Wi-Fi stuff that your routers do now. So they allow your laptop and your phone and your tablet to connect to the Internet. But at the same time, they're going to power and communicate with a bunch of sensors in your, in your house. So there could be a surveillance camera for security. Uh, your smoke alarm sensor might be powered and read this way. All kinds of uh, burglar alarm type sensors could work this way. Um, temperature sensors used by your Nest or your other thermostat system uh, could all use this, be powered this way. Then another thing that I also think is exciting is something like your phone, which of course has a battery, could also still have a mode where it's wirelessly powered just for some very simple functions like, like finding it. So even if my battery is dead, if my house can kind of make contact with the phone and find out where it is, that could be really exciting. So stay tuned to hear more about that. Um, <clears throat> Now, to step back and just going to conclude uh, uh, now, um, it's exciting to think about how all these different things that, that I've showed you uh, can potentially uh, work together. Um, in the Neural Engineering Center, we're combining many of these uh, ideas and many of these technologies, so doing things like brain sensing, communicating using backscatter from those sensors, using the near-field power to provide large amounts of power for these brain sensors. And then you can also imagine using that, those near-field uh, charging systems to recharge uh, you know, prosthetic limbs or, or other robots. So there's really a lot of exciting uh, opportunities still going on here. So to conclude, um, you know, what I've shown hopefully is that wireless power is enabling us to implant electronics in the body and as well as other uh, places where we don't want to be going in and out all the time like buildings and other structures. We can uh, we can build sensing intelligence into these, these uh, uh, buildings and so forth without putting in batteries and wires. More specifically, back to the LVADs, uh, if, we can, if we can make it work, uh, left ventricular assist devices could potentially close the large gap in heart, heart transplants uh, uh, per year. Um, we're also working on various other uh, implanted electronic devices, so trying to restore limb function, after spinal cord injury, brain-computer interfaces, peripheral nerve systems. And finally, uh, you know, wireless power is enabling electronics to become much more pervasive, both in the body uh, and in the environment. So the possibilities are, are really limitless. I'd like to thank the various sponsors, uh, including Intel, National Science Foundation, NIH, Google, Paul Allen Family Foundation, uh, Center for Sensory Motor Neural Engineering, the Center for Commercialization, Washington Research Foundation. And of course, uh, my graduate students have done all the work. Some of them are here. Uh, it's really impressive and amazing to see the great uh, work that they're doing, and it's a pleasure to work with them. So thanks very much, uh, and I guess I can take questions in just a second. <laughs>